everybody, Richard again here from Electric Classic Cars and today's episode is all about the VW Synchro. So this episode is going to be a little bit different than most because a lot of the episodes we uh, do are about finished vehicles, talking a little bit about the tech here and there, but it's a finished vehicle and today we're going to get deep down and dirty into the technical stuff because we're halfway through this conversion so you can see what's involved in converting an electric car. So we'll start off with externals. Um, what have we done? Uh, light bar. Um, this guy's going to be traveling quite a bit off road. In fact, later on this year, he's going to be traveling to Egypt in this vehicle. So uh, we put a light bar on for um, uh, night driving. These things are amazing. I don't know if anybody's ever used these. Well, obviously people have. It's like lighting up the whole sky when you put these on off roading at night. So we've got a light bar on there. Um, suspension lift. Um, so we've got an aftermarket kit on here that raises the uh, whole vehicle off the ground, gives it a bit more ground clearance for off-roading. And in fact, believe it or not, this is on its lowest setting. This can go up about another three inches yet as well, which will give us not only more ground clearance, but also the opportunity to put bigger wheels and tyres on. So we're thinking of putting some good old-fashioned BF Goodrich off-roady tyres on as well later on. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, solar panels on the roof. So we've got some two solar panels up there. Now, they're not really powerful enough to charge up the, the big battery down here. That it just wouldn't really give it any noticeable amount of uh, energy into the big battery. So what they're doing is just trickle charging the 12-volt battery. Um, all right, that's the external sort of things. I, before we get into the EV sort of things, I just want to cover one thing on the internals, which we've changed as well. So over here. Now you find me in my natural habitat, the kitchen area. Isn't that right, Tim? <laughs> I was going to say, that's the closest you've been to a sink and a, and a cooker for a long time, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so one thing we've changed in this vehicle, and it's quite a fundamental thing, is we've got rid of the gas hob because we didn't really, and the customer didn't want anything fossil fuel orientated um, that he had to be carrying around when he's going all the way on his adventures down to places like Egypt. So we've changed it out for an induction hob. So this is a good idea in principle, creates us a problem in practice because that's 2.4 kilowatts and it's 240 volts AC. So that means we need to be able to power that from the big battery that's inside there. And I'll come to that in a minute. So shout out to Nick at Air Tiris. He's done a cracking job of uh, creating this um, hob um, top for us. So we've got a new sink in here. So there's your, your water there, your induction hob there, storage area underneath there, and obviously uh, electric fridge and everything uh, as well. So induction hob and kitchenette system sits inside there. So that's one of the main changes we've made inside this vehicle. So I think it's only fair now to start on the EV side of things. So let's go to the back of the car and talk about the motor. Now, before we open up and have a look inside there, I just want to show you where we've put the charge port because this vehicle has gone through some um, transformations, let's say. The original VW engine was gone. The Subaru engine was in. Not only that, but it was an also an LPG conversion as well. So it's now on its fourth drivetrain configuration, if you like. So um, we had a problem as to where to put the charge port because around the side here, you'll see there's a blank out because the original filler um, is only about that size. It's round and that's not big enough for the CCS port. So we've got CCS uh, charging on this, 150 kilowatt peak, and AC charging as well there. And uh, this is a, you know, a standard feature on a, uh, a T3 or T25, um, which is just giving you access to the uh, engine fluids. Actually, a question for you guys out there. What is the difference between a T25 and a T3? Because I used to think a T25 was the air-cooled version and a T3 was the water-cooled version, but I don't think I'm right there. So... Answers below in comments, please, to all you VW experts out there. What's the difference between a T25 and T3, please? Right, and now it's time to go inside. Right, now we're getting into it. So what have we got? I, first thing to say is I wanted to keep the amazing four-wheel drive off-road capability of the Synchro, which meant keeping the uh, gearbox and the prop shaft and all the rest of it and attaching a motor to that system. So what we've got in here is a Zonic 120 motor um, running at 400 volts and uh, it's a 120 kilowatt 
280 newton meters of torque, so it's plenty powerful enough to push this beast along. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, well, liquid cooled. Uh, the inverter is on the end of the motor, which is another thing I love about the Sonic 120. So everything is kind of like in one unit, very compact uh, little motor. So it's a Sonic 120 motor in here, adapter plate, which we've uh, made up obviously here to go onto the existing gearbox. So yes, you will have gears, you'll be able to change gears as you go along. But the most important thing is it keeps that fantastic VW Synchro uh, drivetrain 4x4 system. So now you're starting to see some of the complexities that we have to uh, overcome when we do a conversion. So uh, you've got things like coolant systems, you've got uh, low voltage looms, um, you've got high voltage looms. So again, orange is uh, where all the high voltage is going. And every 30 centimeters or 300 mil, if you like, uh, you've got to have um, cable clamps just to hold those cables in place. So you'll see things like these things down here, which just hold everything in place. Um, and what else we got? So we've got going in here, we've got a vacuum pump for the brake system. We've got a, a junction box uh, there. Um, another junction box down here, the CCS coming in here as well. And then uh, you'll notice there's also orange cables coming here. That's because there's another battery box that goes here as well as the others in, inside. So we've got, a, I think it's a 100 kilowatt hour battery box in this as well, which will give a decent amount of range, uh, obviously a plus 200 mile range, but until we get to drive this uh, amazingly aerodynamic beast uh, on the road, we won't know uh, what the range is, but um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's gonna be 200 mile plus. So that's the motor side of things. Um, let's talk about battery boxes. Okay, we're inside uh, the Synchro now, and you can see uh, the three battery boxes. We've got another one that goes over the engine um, bay hatch as well. So um, the reason why we haven't put them underneath, because probably people are thinking, why didn't you put it underneath? Well, on a Synchro, you've got a massive prop that goes front to back. But if you actually eat, uh, look uh, underneath um, a VW, there's not actually uh, a decent amount of room without compromising your ground clearance to put a battery pack. I'm never a fan of putting them underneath either because of the A, open up to the elements, and B, open, um, especially in the VW Synchro off-roader, open to things hitting them. So that's why we've gone for battery packs inside and within the original uh, confines, if you like, of the cabinets and seating arrangement of the bus. So this um, battery pack here, that is actually underneath the um, back seat. And that's why it's got these mounts on here, because the back seat rock and roll bed um, attaches to it. And so it's mounted on the original um, seat mounts to the floor. So that's one battery box. And then there's another battery box here. And there's usually a, um, like a stool there. If I grab this, you'll see what I mean. So originally there's, there was kind of a stool seat here anyway. And all we've done, we've extended it probably by about four inches to come this way and kept that it's even <laughs> the same dimensions to be fair. So all we've got to do is build a cushion that goes a little bit further out. So another battery box there. And as I say, the, the final battery box just sits over the uh, engine bay hatch and actually is exactly the same height as the original cabinet that was there to lift um, uh, the, the base, if you like, enough to be able to match with a rock and roll bed when it comes out. So I think it's three and a bit inches. Um, so that battery box sits there. So once everything's in and the cabinets are in and the seats are in, you wouldn't even be able to see where the battery boxes are. So that's the 100 kilowatt hour battery pack. And uh, I think now it's worth showing you some of the, you know, detailed work, if you like. And this is where the, the, the labor and time goes on these conversions um, uh, on the electric side of things. Because, you know, the fabricators do a fantastic job of building the battery boxes and the motor mounts and other bits and pieces like that, which obviously takes time. But the lion's share of the time is in the wiring and you'll see why next. So let's have a look in the front. Now, this gives you a good idea of um, you know, the wiring. And this is just the low voltage wiring. There's high voltage wiring around everywhere as well. And you'll probably see some of that underneath because we haven't quite finished crimping that all up yet. But it's the low voltage wire that's the complexity, if you like. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not just hundreds. I think there's probably thousands of um, 
ends that we have to make up on the wires. I mean, if you just look around, and Tim will zoom in um, accordingly, but I mean, you've got, you know, looms like this going everywhere. And then uh, once you've actually crimped off the ends, so this uh, connectors like this, which is going to the CCS controller, uh, you've got to make every single little crimp and what have you, and they're all different designs of crimp and different crimping tools and it's the crimping tools that cost the money but if you don't buy the crimping tools the the crimps just um you know are not right quite frankly so right tools for the right job but somebody's making a lot of money out of crimping tools believe me but you can see once we've done the looms and you know there's dashboard loom in here as well once it's all done and dusted and tested then it gets wrapped so it be starts to become a little bit more tidy like you can see here for instance so that's the end result but before you get to that you you start with you know this and it's just running throughout the car i mean just in this area alone we've got things like the vcu we've got the dc to dc converter we've got a timing system in there we've got a display we've got an mcu in there we've got a 12 volt battery down there there's a 12 volt uh, relay box there which is our relay box um because the the vehicles one is up there you've got fuses in here as well um over this side you've got the ccs controller you've got the ac controller so i mean we've in this vehicle we've got you know all the the options if you like from air conditioning to power steering obviously it had power steering originally but there's a electric power steering pump at the back um, you know, as I say, CCS, and the reason why we've got two DC to DC converters is because, don't forget when I mentioned the um, uh, induction hob before, that's a 2.4 kilowatt induction hob, which means that we need to get juice to that, so we've got to take the 400 volt DC uh, down to 12 volt um, DC, and then 12 volt DC then back up to 240 volt AC. Um, there is a system that we are just testing, but it's a little bit too early to put it in this vehicle, which is a 400 volt to 240 volt AC um, uh, converter. So uh, on future builds, we'll probably do it that way. But on this one, we've had to go two um, DC to DC converters to get us up to the power that we need to put into the 12 volt battery to then be able to support the uh, 240 volt AC 2.4 kilowatt induction hub and the other stuff that runs off the electrics as well which is the fridge and bits and pieces like that so yeah this gives you a good idea of the complexity and why it takes so much time and money to convert a vehicle properly because you know it's not only about the fabrication believe me there's a lot of fabrication in here as well because all these little things here they have to get mounted properly as well so the guys have to uh, make custom mounts for all these bits and pieces but it's all this wiring and cabling um, and to do it right takes time um, so that's the cabling side of things i think it's worth while finishing uh, on the front of the vehicle probably and just taking you through some of the coolant aspects as well because you know it's not an engine in here, but it still needs cooling. So let's have a look at the front. Now on the subject of interiors, obviously we've also got to change the instrumentation on these vehicles. So we do things like, well, there's a number of different ways to do it, but on the Synchro, what we're doing is, because we're keeping the drivetrain, we can actually keep things like the Speedo. And on the RPM uh, Taco here, what we'll probably do is just give it an input from the motor just to make that needle move it won't really do much um it won't tell you much let's say but the other thing is things like the engine temperature and the fuel gauge here they're redundant so the thing, what we have to do then is um blank out that so that when that goes over like so you've still got things like the the indicators the warning lights and stuff uh, there but also some of the other smaller gauges that were here as well, we've got to fill those holes. So you've got things like, what's this? This is battery percentage. So that will obviously sit in there like, like so. And on this particular dashboard, there's also a number of other dials as well. And these ones, the guy's gone crazy at the dial shop. Um, so we've already got one in there and there's one here, which is the pack voltage. So you've got the 12 volt battery voltage there. The pack voltage will probably go in there. And then we've got another load of gauges in a box just down there as well, which will go there and, and on here. So, uh, yep, instrumentation is another thing which you have to cover on EV conversions. And uh, that's what we're gonna do on the Synchro.
Now up front, again, you can see uh, things like the low voltage loom coming in here, and obviously that's going to get wrapped and protected uh, once we've tested everything works okay. So, but at the moment that's um, uh, bare, so you can see how many wires there is just coming to the front of the vehicle here. Um, and then obviously they've got the charger there. You've got some high voltage um, coming in there. That's uh, twin core, so that's probably for the um, air conditioning compressor. So that's going to sit up there. And then um, obviously coolant wise, we've got a couple of custom radiators we've had to make. So one's going to sit behind there. That uh, looks like that is the motor and inverter radiator. So that's going to be there. Then there'll be another similar one above it there for the battery. And then you'll probably have another one over here then for the air conditioning. Um, so there's the, be the condenser over there for the air conditioning. So just for coolant, you know, you've got your coolant lines and stuff there. So just for the coolant side of things alone, uh, there's quite some complexity going on. You've also got some fans over here for the um, air... Um, uh, air handling system I'd probably call it um, so your heater and um, your air conditioning so you got a fan there and I think there's probably one buried down there as well um, actually on the air conditioning let's um, let's show the air box it's probably quite interesting for uh, some people because we get quite often asked where's the heating and how's the air conditioning work on these conversions so uh, let's have a ganders at that now we've got the air box out of the uh, synchro here quite a big cumbersome beast of a thing and inside here, Neil has had to find a home for a number of these, which are uh, PTC heater elements. So think uh, hand dryer in a washroom, if you like. It's um, basically instant heat, fan comes on, and away you go. So in here, I buried a number of these. Um, there's a temperature sensor coming out there by the looks of it. So yeah, there we go. So there's your high voltage input uh, for the heating elements. So that's the heating side of things but obviously when you're in a place like Egypt that's the last thing you're going to be turning on so that's when you're going to need one of these which is the air conditioning uh, evaporator so if you follow me inside I'll show you where that lives so here you'll see another custom fabricated thing we've done um, outside was the fan that then feeds the fresh air through here and then the evaporator then sits in there and then it blows that lovely cool air out and then through into the air box, which I showed you before. So just to get something like aircon into uh, one of these electric vehicles um, conversions is a complicated thing. Because not only do you have to put in the uh, electric condenser, but also the um, compressor, sorry, uh, but also the condenser at the front, all the uh, pipe work, the evaporator, and then you have to incorporate that into the existing air boxes along with things like the... Uh, um, AC, ECU, and it's got to be temperature controlled as well, so it's not just an on-off thing, so you need to have thermostats and be able to actually set the temperature to what you need it to be. So there you go, it's not as easy as you might think. So there you go, I hope you've enjoyed this video and uh, it's showing you um, some of the complexities and you know the amount of time it takes to do one of these conversions properly. But uh, the thing I'm most looking forward to on this is driving it because I've got my Land Rover, uh, I'm sorry, I love my off-roading, and anybody that doesn't know I've got an electric Land Rover, you can click on the video above and you can find out more about it up there. But this kind of has everything for me. It's got, you know, it's a VW, which I love. It's got the off-road capability of a Synchro with a fantastic 4x4 um, uh, drivetrain, but it's got a camper interior. And I don't know if you're like me, but, you know, I blame Tim for this. Going camping in a tent is not fun anymore, and you've got like a trailer tent, haven't you? Yeah, I've got a camper. I'm too old to sleep on the floor now. It's, it's, it's an, an age thing. It's an age thing, yeah, yeah you need to keep you, off the floor. You're right. I mean, you know, uh, I went recently uh, camping uh, an electric camper, a customer's one, and, you know, having the ability to sleep on a nice, comfortable bed rather than on the floor in a tent, it's a game changer for me. So I quite fancy having a, a VW Synchro camper conversion like this. Because, um, uh, you know, doing that wild camping overlander thing, I just love it. Um, and on that, that note, I'm interested to know what other overlander 4x4 vehicles would make a good camper? You know, certainly one I've had in my mind is a Pinsgauer. Pinsgauer, that's my top. 
yeah, top, you, top of the you've list. You've always yeah. got a thing for them, haven't you? Yeah, fantastic. So what vehicle. are the vehicles out there do you think would make a fantastic 4x4 Overlander camper? And on that note, I hope you enjoyed this video and we'll see you on the next one.